All right, so this is multi-site's uh, do's and don'ts, best friend or worst enemy. We'll talk about that and we'll decide which one, which camp you might be in. So just so I, I know the audience, how many people here are developers? Okay, most of the room. Who has used multi-site before? Most of the room. Okay, great. We're gonna skip over a lot of the basic stuff and we're gonna get right to the meat of this. So ignore when I skip a couple of slides. Um, so let's dive into this. So. I'm Taylor4484 at Twitter. Um, follow me, use hashtag multisite, send me your photos. Um, there'll also be links to these slides in my tweets. So follow that. Um, all right, so me, I'm a technical product manager at WP Engine. I've been there for about a year. Previously worked at Indeed.com as an interaction designer, so I've got a design background. Um, as it was mentioned, I paid for college by building WordPress websites for the past six years. Um, an interesting piece is uh, I have a Bachelor of Arts in Theater and Dance. Uh, I always like putting that up here because I don't have a technical background, uh, but building websites for theater and dance is how I got started with multi-site, and it's something that you can teach yourself. Um, so I always like putting that up there. You don't have to have a technical background to be able to use a multi-site. Uh, but we'll talk about uh, the use cases for multi-site. So quick disclaimer, my advice based on my experience may not uh, get you to where it's gotten me. Every project's unique. There's an exception to every rule that I make up. Um, Plugins will do everything I say multi-site should or wouldn't do. Um, so I'll, I'll reference plugins you should use, write those down. Uh, so let's jump straight into what people are saying about multi-site. Tried to use multi-site to manage multiple sites and I just got myself confused. That's how I started. <laughs> uh, multi-site's amazing, why would anyone not use it? I sometimes feel this way. Uh, multi-site is hard, yes, it can be. Um, we had a project that was running a multi-site and then we converted to a standard WordPress install. That's sad. I've done that too. <laughs> Not fun. Um, I don't use anything but multi-site. I used to say this was me, but this isn't me anymore. I find that there's some other use cases that are not multi-site, which we'll talk about here. Um, but I think this quote to me is actually the most important when we're talking about multi-site. This is by JJJ on the Make Core. Uh, multi-site is now a utility for managing multiple sites using one installation, whereas the original vision was to enable blogging networks. So when you think about that, what multi-site was built to do is not how people are wanting to use multi-site. And I think that's a really critical thing to understand here, is that it is not built to do what people want to do with it. Uh, and we'll talk about sort of those use cases and why or why not to use multi-site. So with my theater and dance background, I find that this really strikes me whenever I talk about multi-site. Um, multi-site is, it can be your best friend or your worst enemy and most likely at, both at the same time. Um, and we'll dive into why. So we'll quickly cover this, but it seems like most of y'all know what multi-site is. It's a network, a collection of sites that share the same single installation of WordPress. Um, some terminology, just so we're on the same page. When I say install, I'm talking about the installation of WordPress. There's one of these in multi-site. It's one install of WordPress. Uh, you've got a network, which has sites in it, and that is your network multi-site. Um, so that's just the terminology, terminology we'll use here. So what isn't a multi-site? I find that this one is a really important distinction whenever we're talking like, I want a multi-site. Okay, well, let's make sure it's not these things. Um, a network of sites that can be moved to separate hosts. A multi-site, is one installation of WordPress, so it lives on one host. Um, you can't move that. One host, one install of WordPress, many sites, go forth and profit. Um, a set of sites that can be easily separated into their own WordPress installs. When you put a subsite into a multi-site network, it's part of that network, unless you do a lot of work and you don't want to have to do that work because serialized data is not fun to mess with. Uh, and that's what you're going to be dealing with if you try to un-multi-site a multi-site. Um, and then a, site, a set of sites that can have different IP addresses. Back to the first point, it's a multi-site network that lives on one host, so it has one IP address. That IP address is probably gonna change later, and we'll talk about that, uh, see first point. So when I talk to people about multi-site, I like using this analogy. It's like a big multi-site apartment complex. Um, you've got a shared roof, which is your hosting platform, that's where everything lives, that's your file system, your database, it all lives inside that, a shared roof. You've got common space, which is the file system. Everything in the multi-site network shares the same file system, which is really important to understand. We'll talk about that later. 
Uh, and then you've got the private apartments. Like you've got a key to your apartment, and you can log into separate multi or separate subsites in the multi-site network, but they're still part of the larger building. Um, so some things when we think about the sort of multi-site in this way is be a good neighbor. You want to be very careful about who is in your multi-site network because by definition, they share a lot of things, and you want to trust everyone that's sharing all of those. Don't trust strangers, so don't let them into the building. Um, keep subsites that should not be part of the network out and in their own separate install. Remember that because it's one host, one install of WordPress, the more sites you assemble in a multi-site network, the more security risk, the single point of failure, like there's, you're putting a lot of eggs in one basket, and you don't want to contaminate that with anything bad. Um, and then always lock your apartment door. Um, this, I think this one surprises me a lot. It's like, yeah, I'll just use like username and password. It's my username and password. But no, not a good answer because when someone hacks your one site, they've hacked all of your sites in the multi-site network. Um, so always lock your apartment door. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to secure a multi-site network. Uh, we won't go in heavily into this, but there are two admin sections. There's WP admin, which we all know and love. And then there's the WP admin network interface, which is where you add sites, you manage your users, your themes, plugins, and all of that. We won't go into that. Y'all seem to know this. We're all good. We, we're like, yeah, we know this. Like, keep going. OK. Um, open or closed site. This is one of the biggest decisions you have to make when you're making a multi-site network. And terminology is hard, even on core. No one really has the correct term for this. Um, is it public network? Is it open? Is it untrusted? It's all of those things. Um, Essentially, what that means is it's an open site. Anyone can come and sign up for a subsite in that multi-site network. Um, so great examples, WordPress.com. That is a large multi-site network. One installation of WordPress that is running a ton of sites, and we'll talk numbers here in a bit. Uh, one of my favorites, HappyTables.com. This is a multi-site of restaurant websites that's built on WordPress completely customized uh, interface, but you go pay them however much money a month, and you get a WordPress website that is intended to build restaurant websites. Uh, the other interesting one is university student blogs. This is a really popular way for universities to give their students .edu web addresses, ranked to the top of Google. Um, these are generally done as untrusted networks, so allowing anyone to come in, sign up if you're a student, um, and get a site. Um, there's some concerns with an untrusted network, though, is you're dealing with unknown file types, and anyone can upload anything to your site, which uh, potentially introduces malicious scripts um, and embeds, because we all know that when I want to embed this tweet, I'm going to go search uh, on Google and take the first little JavaScript snippet that probably is malicious and put it in my site. Um, all concerns, because again, if your site gets hacked, your multi-site, you've hacked all the sites inside of that. Um, the other piece to this is copyright and DMCA. Um, whenever you're allowing anyone to upload content and post in your multi-site network, because you own that network, you're liable for whatever content gets posted there. Um, so just be really careful about that. Know that you might have to take down a site because of a copyright request. And then the ones that I generally build are private networks. These are closed. Not anyone can come and register. You have to be invited to register for a multi-site. Um, examples, WordCamp.org. That is a private multi-site network that organizers of WordCamps can join and create multi-sites to run WordCamp websites. Company intranets, this is another great example. Companies for all of their internal departments want a private network that not anyone can join, but they can keep all of their stuff in one place. Um, colleges actually are another great example. We've got universities who have multiple colleges and multiple schools and multiple departments. They want all of that encapsulated in a single place. Multi-site's a really good answer to that. Um, some concerns with a private network, though, is too many cooks. Too many people who want to go change a whole bunch of things. And because things are shared, themes, users, plugins, changing one plugin or one theme here changes it for every network site um, that's using that theme or plugin. The other problem that I find a lot is there's not any cooks at all. Someone's like, yeah, I want a multi-site network. And then it's like, OK, who's going to run this? Like, Who's going to do updates and all of that? And it's like, you. No, no, not me. Uh, you need a super admin to come in and manage all of this. They're like, we'll get back to you on who that should be. Um, and then, of course, code changes affect all sites. Because by definition, WordPress multi-site is a shared file system, code changes are going to affect anything that's on the site. You change a plugin, 
and it runs on all of the sites, if you forget that closing PHP bracket and you white screen the site, you've just white screened all of the sites in the multi-site network. Um, update uh, some CSS on a theme to hide that one thing you don't like, well, you've just hidden that across the network. Um, so you've got to be careful with that. But there's ways to get around that, and we'll talk about those. Uh, the other decisions you have to make is subfolders, subdomains, and domain mapping. Um, so let's back up. Let's do subdomains. So I actually prefer using subdomains. I think it's the most flexible option when you're building a multi-site, and that's for SEO reasons. Uh, if we look at subfolders, if the first person who comes and creates a, a site chooses blog is the name of their site, guess who can't use slash blog? Anyone else in the multi-site network. Um, that's why I stay away from subfolders, because those slugs end up preventing other subsites in that multi-site network from using it. Um, so it just it, get, it runs away very quickly. Um, whereas subdomains, anyone can have that trailing blog if they want it, but only one site can have blog.mysite.com. Um, for SEO reasons, generally subdomains are going to be your best option if you're choosing between uh, subdomains or subfolders. Um, and then there's domain mapping. So everyone is familiar with sunrise.php? The whole room's like, yes, no, not anymore. Um, interesting, I actually don't like using sunrise.php. If you're unfamiliar with this, go Google it on the codex. It'll show up, it'll give you a long document on how to set that up. There is a plugin that you run to map domains that shipped as a separate plugin, but it's like from core WordPress. I um, actually don't like that at all. It's very uh, old. Um, there's this fantastic project by Human Made Mercador um, that is the modern domain mapping for multi sites. Um, I use or Mercator specifically when I'm domain mapping for multi sites. It's the best modern way to do domain mapping. So, highly recommend that you check that out and use that to map domains. Um, there's also premium plugins that allow you to sell domains to your users who are adding sites to the network. Um, WPMU Dev sells one of these plugins. It's great. It'll auto configure DNS. You hook it up to a registrar, um, and you can make a little bit of money, let people customize their domains, and they just auto set up with your network. Really cool if you want to allow that as a, sort of a, a paid option. All right, here's a big one. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier that your subsite or your multi-site network has one IP address, and that IP address is probably going to change, um, and that's cool. Okay. Your host will change it for any variety of reasons. They may or may not tell you that they're going to change it. Um, and if you're using an A record, and just for anyone uh, uncertain about these, these are what make your domain name point to your WordPress installation. If you're using an A record, which is tied to an IP address, when that IP address changes, every site in the network is going to stop resolving. I had this happen with a client once. It was about a 300 uh, subsite network. All of them were domains mapped with different registrars. All of them had a record set up, and the host changed the IP address of the site. And magically, I get a call that's like, all 300 of our sites are down. Like, DNS isn't resolving. And I'm like, no, you didn't use a records, did you? They're like, yeah, we did. Track down the login for about 20 different registrars. And of course, all of the registrars have different UIs. And it's just a mess. Please, please, please use CNames. Your host will provide you with something that looks like this, most likely, that points to your WordPress installation. That your host maintains the A record link for. You set up the CNAME. If your host change IP addresses, they change that on their end. You have to make no changes. Um, so please, please, please do yourself and the world a favor. Please use CNAMES if you're mapping domains for multi-site networks. All right. I love this shirt. I need to get one of these. Uh, so a super admin. This is one step above an admin uh, for just general WordPress. And this allows you to manage the site, manage the themes, manage everything inside of the network. Um, you should dole out super admin privileges like they are like super, super private because only one, maybe two or three people need super admin access. Lock this down. I'm talking like 26 character password. Like you do not want someone to be an admin, a super admin in your network and to run amok. There's a lot of extra settings. There's a lot of things that you need to know what you're doing when you're using super admin privileges. Uh, you can see the list here. You can full, see the full capabilities there. Lock this down. This goes back to that too many cooks. You only want a couple super admins in your network. Uh, shared users. 
this is one of the benefits of using a multi-site, um, is that all of your users inside of the multi-site network, when you log into one site, you log into all the sites in the network. Um, interesting piece, though, is that if you're needing to use two-factor auth on your multi-site network, this is not going to work. Um, for security reasons. The whole point of two-factor auth is that you log into every subsite. So if the reason you're choosing a multi-site network is so that everyone is globally logged in, know this is a deal breaker. Uh, you'll log in for every site. Here's some examples of these plugins, Google, uh, Duo2, two-factor auth. Um, and here's how this kind of presents itself. This really confused me for the longest time until I was like, hmm, I'm on CNN and I'm on TechCrunch. But that's my WordPress.com account. And I'm logged into these sites. And then sure enough, I do some research. Both of these sites are on the WordPress.com uh, VIP platform. You log into WordPress.com, you are logged into every single site in that multi-site network. Um, they may or may not show you the login bar, but you're logged into those sites, which is like a, whoa, that could be really cool or really scary. Um, so just know that's something you have to be really careful about. Uh, the interesting piece of that, too, is that when you're logged into all of those sites, guess what? Your user meta is shared across all of those sites. So side story, I was building a multi-site network where each subsite was a different language. And that was great until we got to the author bios section. And then magically, somehow your bio is supposed to be in different languages on every site. But that doesn't work because it's shared metadata across the network. So my profile was always in English across any of the sites. Um, there's a plugin to fix that, as there is for anything. Um, this will allow you to have uh, different user metas on different subsites. So if that's the case, this plugin will solve your problem and save me a lot of work. Um, shared themes, you can share themes across the network. This is great if you're having a network and you want to provide a subset of themes that you have approved, that you've code reviewed, and you're confident that those are good themes, that they don't do bad things. Um, you can network enable themes allow, force everyone to use them, or you can opt in to let certain sites use certain themes. Um, changes to themes affect all sites that are using them. So how do we get, uh, how do we get around that? We use child themes. Um, this is a cool plugin that I found a while back ago. It essentially creates a child theme for every subsite on the multi-site network. That way, instead of editing the parent theme, you edit the child theme for every subsite. That gives you that granular control, but not having to edit the, the actual theme that is shared across everything. Uh, and that allows you to update these themes, too, because one of the biggest security vulnerabilities in a multi-site network is just not updating. Um, so this is going to help you keep your themes up to date and keep those secure. Shared plugins, same story here. Interesting point is any plugin you have installed, not necessarily activated, that code is running on your multi-site network. That's a scary thought. Um, this is something that you really need to be careful about. And when you're adding sites to your multi-site network, if you find like, oh, I add this site and I need to add 12 plugins because they have custom functionality, it's like, should that site be in your multi-site network if I have to activate 12 plugins for just that subsite? Because again, that plugin code is going to run across the network. So I'm taking a hit on all my other sites for this one site just to run those special plugins. So think about that when you're activating plugins in a multi-site network. They're shared. Settings in two places. This one was really confusing to a lot of people for a while. This is a popular plugin, SEO by Yoast. But there's two setting pages here. Um, this confused a lot of my uh, clients that I build multi-sites for. They're like, my settings are missing. I'm like, no, no, they're there. They're in the multi-site network admin, which you don't have access to because you're not a super admin. And no, you can't have super admin access. Uh, but then I have to go in and make changes for them when they're wanting to make changes to their multi-site network, which is frustrating. Uh, something to just be aware of that plugins can put settings in different places on multi-site. And the sad part is, is multi-site core has not standardized this. So every plugin just kind of does it whatever way they want to. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, too. So let's get into the file structure differences. What makes a multi-site different from a standard WordPress install? The interesting piece is that if you have a normal WordPress installation, you already have all the code for multi-site. It's the same WordPress. You just change a couple lines in your WP config, 
add a couple lines to your HT access, which WordPress will generate for you and tell you where to put it, and boom, you've got a multi-site network. Um, same code, you don't have to switch out core, same core, one installation of WordPress. Um, if you're using domain mapping, you're going to get into the sunrise.php. What are we all going to do? We're all going to use Mercator because it's better than sunrise.php. Um, and then, of course, your WP content has some different subfolders. So let's dig into what this actually looks like. So file structure differences. You've got a multi-site install here, single site install here. The interesting piece truly is uploads. So you're going to have uploads. You're going to have your standard set of your files here. This is the first site in your network. Then as you add more multi-sites, you're going to get this sites folder. It's like, hmm, what's that? Um, what is site two? I don't know. I'm going to have to go look at the database and see what subsite that is. Uh, there's a plugin, which uh, I did not add here, that will tell you what site two is. Um, I will tweet that plugin out later. But essentially, as you add multi-sites or as you add subsites to your multi-site network, you're going to get more site folders here, and they're going to contain the year folders for all your uploads there. Now, hmm, is there a problem with this? Yes, there is, because my sub, uh, my child. Uh, sites that are in my network are nested inside of upload. So it's all the same file system. So if I want to give, if we all have uh, subsites in my multi-site network, I can't give you root access because we're all going to have access to everyone's content. And that's not good because someone's going to inevitably go delete the whole thing. And where's all of our uploads? Um, so pro tip here, rely on your host to allow site admins to only access specific directories. So this is something you can do on WP Engine. You say, hey, I want a new SFTP login. Cool, username, password, and then a path that that user can access. I want to only grant that user access to site two, because they are an admin on site two, but not the rest of them. Now, of course, you see a problem with this. You can't do that for the root, because this is site number one. So here's another pro tip. Don't use the first site and a multi-site network. The site ID of one, don't use it because it's at the root of uploads and that screws up the whole rest of this because I can't give you access to uploads because you'll have access to all of the subsites. So I generally use the first site in the network as mine. That's just like, we're not using this site for anything. It's just the admin like lockdown. Um, so just some tips there. Now here's where I actually really like talking about multi-site. Database differences. So normal WordPress, 10 tables, OK? We're pretty familiar with this. I asterisk these because they'll be shared. Um, so multi-site. So you get all of the 10 normal tables. Then you get your multi-site tables. These are just things about what the blogs are, what the sites are. Interesting. Notice that this is blogs. This is because multi-site was originally set up for blogging networks, not the way people are using multi-site today. Who signs up for the site, what the sites are, site metadata, stuff like that. But here's where it gets interesting. Per every multi-site subsite in the network, we're going to add eight more tables. That doesn't look like it scales, does it? Hmm. Let's walk through these numbers. Tables in one multi-site database. There's the formula. OK, 24 tables. I, cool. 96 tables. I'm like, OK, I'm going to be a database uh, admin now. Ooh, one database. And then this one. What's this one? WordPress.com. WordPress.com <laughs> WordPress as of July 2015. I'm not even going to try to read this number. <laughs> that is in one multi site network. One multi-site network. No. <laughs> no. This is where you pay a lot of money for hosting. Uh, the interesting piece, though, is WordPress.com truly is a vanilla multi-site install. There's nothing special there. But guess what you can't do? Install your own plugins. Install your own themes. Why? Because that code is highly vetted to not be adding custom tables, to not be uh, doing lots of bad things. Um, and that allows them to scale WordPress.com. Crazy. WordPress, doc, uh, WordPress uh, multi-sites can scale. You're going to pay a lot of money to make that happen. So let's talk about choosing the right host. 
please use a managed host. Um, let me, uh, Word or WP Engine, SiteGround, GoDaddy Manage, please use a managed host. These are hosts that are optimized for WordPress. Um, they're just going to save you a lot of time. Other things you need to look at with these hosts, though, are sites that have automatic backups. You want to be able to, in one click, backup and restore your site. When it's a multi-site, you want to make sure that you have the ability to download that backup because it's not helpful if you back up your site and then your site goes down and it's like, oh, my backups are down too. That's not helpful. You need to have access to that backup, so make sure you can download it. Built-in staging sites. Um, this is a really popular one. Um, not many managed hosts have this. Um, and definitely not many sites have, or not many uh, managed WordPress hosts have uh, staging sites that just work with multi-site. You want to, in one click, say, I want a staging copy of my multi-site install. And you do whatever black magic you're doing to make all of those subsites have uh, staging sites that you can go work on. Because you're all going to, say it with me, we're not going to work on production on a multi-site network. <laughs> Please, no. On a multi-site network, when I forget to close that closing PHP uh, bracket and I bring down the network of 500 sites, you're going to call me. 500 people are going to call me. and. Yeah, that closing question mark. Forgot that. Yeah, no, we don't cowboy code. So, uh huh. So I'll ask you for your side. Do you manage your domains as well for the multi? No, no. <laughs> but make sure they set up C names. <laughs> um, the other thing you're going to want to look for in a host is granular deploy controls. So it's super cool that you can one click magically create st staging sites, but if I'm making changes to just one, Subsite in my multi-site network, why would I deploy the whole network? That sounds like a lot of risk for a little, probably CSS change. You want to be able to deploy only specific tables and only specific file systems. Reduce any amount of complexity and risk from your deploys. Um, deploy only what needs to come over. If you only made a CSS change, you probably don't need to deploy your database. Only deploy the changes you make. Look for extra security features. Like I said, lock your apartment door. Managed hosts are going to give you a plethora of things that are extra security. Um, they run tons of WordPress websites, and they get attacked all day long. They know a lot about what bad guys look like, and they're going to help you avoid those bad guys. So rely on your managed host to give you extra security. Also, no, there's limitations to hosts. Not all hosts support every setup. In fact, some hosts don't even support multi-site at all. Um, some uh, hosts don't support subfolders or subdomains. Like, make sure whatever kind of multi-site you're building that your host is going to support that. And I'm just going to put this one up here. I won't go. There's a whole other talk. We could talk about this for years. Use version control. Because when someone changes your site and the sites go down and you're not version controlled, it's like, oh, I don't know what code change broke the site in the network. Uh, version control would give you that, and you could easily roll back to the latest, latest known good state. Please use version control. Fine. There's surely another talk about that. And then I'm trying to make this happen. Massive multi-site networks, um, MMSNs as I call them. Um, this is where you need to plan to spend a lot of money or hire a system admin. Uh, this is WordPress.com. When you get to that scale, you're going to spend money to host this network, or you're going to hire someone to go sit in the dark and maintain your database. Um, just know this is expensive, and I really hope all of you go build massive multi-site networks and make lots of money, but know it costs a lot of money to host that network. WordPress.com, this is where you get into database sharding, database replication, geo-redundancy, all of those sorts of things that people in dark rooms with servers talk about and get excited about. Um, pay those people to go do that because, yeah, you don't want to deal with that. Uh, so let's talk about some dev do's. Please set this setting. Disallow file mods. This is that really cool setting when you're logged into the WP admin that allows you to like click themes and click editor, and you get this cool little text box that has your code. You can edit it, and you can save it. And you will definitely lock yourself out of WordPress when you forget that closing PHP bracket, because you shouldn't be editing your themes and plugins inside of the, multi -site, or inside of the WP admin. This setting removes that. This will just kill the admin editor altogether, because it should not be there, especially in a multi-site network. Because again, you edit that one plugin or theme, like, oh, just adding some CSS. 
site goes down, the network goes down. Disallow this. Do not upgrade global tables. This one is only important for large sites. When you have a large site, a large, massive multi-site network, you want to stop plugins from doing bad things with your database. This would prevent your sites from running DB Delta to do upgrade things, which are going to take a lot of time and processing power on your database. And you'll handle all of this yourself. This, again, is where you go hire a database admin, and they're going to take care of your database for you so you don't have to. Some more do's. When you're building plugins, please give some thought to your network and your WP admin settings. This is that Yoast screen I was telling you about earlier. Really think about what settings need to be at the network level and what settings need to be at the site level. Really give that thought and think about it. Uh, because most plugins don't. Um, in fact, I had this one plugin once that it was a social share thing that had like analytics in it, and it was like, it only gave me analytics for the main site. And I'm like, why does that not work? And I looked at the database. Sure enough, they're doing custom tables. But they hadn't written the subroutine to write those tables for every subsite in the network. So I was like, OK, I see where this is going. Just made those tables and all of the, the sub-network uh, database tables. And it was like, yeah, that worked. It was just a plugin developer that didn't think about supporting a, a network. Um, so give that a thought. Split those settings out if needed. And if, they don't need, if you don't need network settings, don't have them. And then when you're disabling a plugin or deleting it, please clean up whatever stuff you have created. If you've created custom tables or custom metas, please clean that up for me when you delete a plugin. Um, plugin authors and developers, you should be cleaning up any custom code that you inject into the database. Um, it's just like nice. Um, one thing to note, though, is when you're building that code to clean up your stuff, Running delete site options across a large network. Let's talk about WordPress.com. If we were to go say, like, delete this plugin, and like, you ran this on all however many millions of sites there were, like, you're going to bring that da database down. Uh, really be careful with this. Uh, use this frugally, but clean up your mess. And then clean up custom sites. The other thing, too, and this one gets a lot of plugin developers, is like, hey, that premium plugin I bought for $12, can I run it in my network? No, you can't. Like I want $12 per every site. Um, give some thought to how you're doing licensing. I would love it if you would let me run your plugin, your premium plugin, on my multi-site network. But it needs to work on the network, and you need to like. I don't want to do API keys for all of my subsites. Like really give thought to how your licensing works if you're building a plugin. So some more do's for you. This is a really cool one. I, this is just in general, not even multi-site specific. Add some custom things. Help people find the settings you're looking for. Um, this allows you to add custom menus. There's a ton of documentation in the codex for this. Allows you to do custom menus here, custom link dropdowns. This is really helpful for your users, especially when you're in a multi-site network where, like, are the settings in my network admin? Where, where are the settings? Like, add some custom help here to help me get to your settings. So theme developers, this one's for you. Please ship your themes with child themes. Please help your users, because everyone knows like we use child themes, right? We all use child themes. But then you have to go make a child theme. And it's like, that's, that's not a straightforward process. If you're building themes, ship with at least one child theme that someone can customize. So you can see this is a, a network, a multi-site network that I run. Uh, and I just have a custom child theme for every language subsite. Please do. Uh, child themes for all of your subsites. And theme developers, make these easy for your users. Because when they, don't, when they inject custom code to your theme, and then you upgrade your theme, and they lose all that, they're going to contact you. So build child themes and help everyone just be better. Also, consider how licensing works. Can I activate your premium theme on my multi-site network that has 95 million uh, subsites on it? Probably not. Give some thought about how this works. Again, think about API keys. If I have to register my theme with an API key and I have to do that for every subsite in the network, like, I'm not going to use your theme um, because that just is a lot of work. So consider how that works with your themes. So some more things. Please go search your code. If you see anything that says unfiltered HTML, kill it with fire. <laughs> or just stop using that theme or that plugin. Like, no. 
I've been burned by this one really bad. Just go search your, your theme. This allows users to post whatever HTML markup or JavaScript code in pages. You know, again, I'm going to go search the internet for whatever malicious script I can find. Put it in my multi-site network. No. Kill this. Kill it with fire. Just don't. Uh, the other thing to not do is loop through your network of sites. There are very specific reasons you might want to do this. Only do it if you know what you're doing. Because again, oh, cool, I'm going to go loop over a network of 95 million sites, and then I'm going to crash your server. No. And if you do do it, <laughs> Thank you. Yes, cache it if you do do it. Correct. Um, use this with caution. Very, very powerful stuff can be done by looping over your network of sites. But it's going to be a big performance hit. Also, you end up with this weird thing where like, you've got variables that's like, what current multi-site am I on? And when you change the, the site that you're on, there's functions that do this. You have to reset those functions to say, no, no, I'm not in this other site. I'm now back in my main site. Um, I'll post some tweets about that. But yeah, just be really careful if you're looping through your network of sites. So let's talk about some use cases. This is uh, the interactive portion of this talk. So, all right, I want to allow users to create their own sites within a network with some constraints. To multi-site or not? What do we think? We're thinking yes? Come on, play games. Yes? No? Sure? sure? Yes. Good answer. <laughs> Use multi-site. This is what multi-site was built to do. Um, interesting things, customize the admin. WordPress.com, you've seen that interface. Um, I have thoughts about that interface, but it's not WordPress. It's not just your WP admin. Like that's custom skinned. Happy Tables does this as well. This is what Happy Tables WP admin looks like. They don't even load the WP admin files. They have created their own. And if you're building a food restaurant, like everything I need is here. Some events, menu, a page, business details. Like I don't need settings and all like no customize this this is really cool stuff and this is a great paid option to use a multi-site network go build a network customize it so that users only need what they need to build their sites and sell those sites for 50 60 bucks a pop per month yes monthly recurring revenue there we go there's a good one to multi-site or not i want to centrally manage all of my client sites multi-site or not i see shaking heads no no yeah, some maybes no. <laughs> this is not what multi-site was built to do. But this is what everybody wants multi-site to be. There are some really great alternatives that do exactly what you're trying to do, but don't introduce the concept of multi-sites. Jetpack site management. Um, you may love or hate Jetpack, whatever. They have a site management thing that allows you to update plugins, to update themes. It's a cool little setup. Uh, WP Remote, it's a free service. You host it yourself. You hook it into all of your sites, and you can upgrade themes, update core, uh, manage users, all sorts of cool stuff. Remotely, manage all of your sites from one dashboard. Uh, manage WP is basically the premium hosted version that you pay for of WP Remote. It has a couple of modules you can add on. Uh, Infinite WP is free, self-hosted, and there's paid add-ons. Um, or you can use WPCLI and script your way through everything. Um, WPCLI does support multi-site networks, so go script yourself to Nirvana. Uh, but you can see so many options here to not use a multi-site if this is what you're trying to do, because this is what everyone wants to do, and it's not what multi-site does. Well, that's, what clients are like. that's a good point. We'll cover that use case in a minute. Um, <laughs> right, exactly. That's a great use, but not to manage all of those sites. I want to have a multi-site network where each site is in a different language. Hmm. We're saying yes? Yeah. Yes? So, well, is it translations of the same site, or is it different sites in different languages? Oh, see, we're going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe multi-site. You've hit on a good point. Yes, there are plugins that will do that. Multi-site uh, WordPress multi-language? Yeah, it's a plugin that only does site translations. Uh, it supports multi-site. Um, but could be, could be not. The thing you need to be really careful about if you choose to go multi-site for this option is SEO. Because what's going to happen is Google's going to come and troll all of your multi-sites, and it's going to be like, hmm, you've got a US and a UK version, and they are identical. You have duplicate content, and I'm going to rank you down Google, because I don't like Google. Google doesn't like duplicate content. 
So how do you get around that? hreflang tags. Go Google these. These are really easy to set up. You do have to custom code these. I have yet to find a plugin that will handle this for you. Um, really sad that this plugin doesn't do this. They should do that. Um, but go Google this. Essentially, all you do is say, hey, Google, this page is in this language. This page is in the US. This page is in the UK. Different pages. Also, use canonical links to say, hey, Google, this page is the same page here except translated. That helps Google say, when I'm Googling on google.co.uk, google.ca, when I'm on Google.ca, <laughs> it's going to show me the Canadian version of a page rather than the English version. If you use hreflang tags, Google's really smart about this and will help show the correct site to the right user. Question over here? Uh, Multi-site language switcher has some dealings with the language tag. I'm not sure it's going to try it yet, but they're trying. So they're trying. I have yet to see that work. Um, I don't know. I haven't used that plugin in about three or four months. It did not work for me, but I, I yeah, down the rabbit hole we go. But. No, it's yeah, like an echo statement that just echo out whatever language this is, especially if you're using WordPress multi-language. It's going to give you a variable that's this is the language of the site. Super simple. Echo out the tag and fill in whatever that language is. Super easy. All right, I have a lot of content. It's kind of different content, but I want all my sites to look different, and it's still all my content. So I want all of it, multi-site or not. These are the questions that I get from my clients. Like, so here's the weird like, thing that I want to build, and I want all my kind. It's like, uh, you want a multi-site, but do you? Yes or no? Halfway. Good. Y'all are catching on. Most likely not multi-site. Maybe if you're doing crazy things. Um, map domains to categories and tags. Keep all your content in a single WordPress install, and serve all of that via different domains. That's an option. Create custom templates for your different categories, uh, custom post types. Like So many ways you can do this and not have a multi-site network and all of that complexity. Still keep all your stuff in a nice little bundle and keep your sites different. Like, there's so many things you can do here. WordPress non-multi-site does this really well. And you can do all sorts of crazy things here. Not a multi-site, most likely. That's it. That's all I got for you. <laughs>